to this panel discussion, which has already been, been well introduced. Um, it's my pleasure to be invited to be moderator of this session. Um, and uh, as, as the um, uh, speaker has just introduced me, I'm, I'm from KSAT, I'm a project manager, but I, I also am the program lead for the NICFI satellite data program, which many of you have heard mentioned, alluded to by the minister yesterday and throughout some of the discussions. Before I introduce the panelists, I, I just want to take the opportunity to set the scene a little bit ahead of the start of this discussion this morning. So we are seeing that satellite technology um, is becoming increasingly important in the forefront of government's agenda when it comes to climate mitigation, whether that be the fight against tropical forest deforestation or monitoring and reducing global emissions. At the same time, satellite technology is also responding and moving towards an alignment to be that more beneficial solution in support of climate policy agenda. And where more and more the understanding and knowledge gathered from complementary solutions, including satellite imagery, can help improve decision-making, planning, and de-risking activities. But that is not to say that, is not, that there is not a lot more work still to be done. It is not a question of satellites replacing traditional methods of monitoring, but that the information collected from a range of sources provides a greater understanding, context, and importantly, a different perspective. One way in which this has been achieved with success is through public-private partnerships. These allow us collectively to facilitate, assess the opportunities to leverage such data. Um, where that has historically had many more barriers to access. These initiatives are the basis for further discussions on how the EO industry, as well as the public sector, can work together collaboratively for a common goal. This panel will touch on some examples of these types of programs, like the NICFI Satellite Data Program, and how these initiatives are identifying opportunities and potential gaps to be considered for future climate policy. I will be joined by a, a panel of five speakers today, and it's my pleasure to begin introducing them. So firstly, please welcome uh, Rolf um, Skatterbo from KSAT. <laughs> Rolf is a co-founder, president, and CEO of Kongsberg Satellite Services, or KSAT. Um, and KSAT is an Earth Observation satellite data provider and leading ground station provider. Um, the, the mission of KSAT is connecting space to Earth. Um, so a big part of what we do is actually helping get that satellite data down from those satellites and being able to distribute that to the satellite operators and importantly to the users who make uh, benefit from those satellite missions. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Julian Fox, Julian Fox is a team leader of the National Forest Monitoring uh, MRV and Platforms at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, he now leads a team of technical specialists at the FAO focused on capacity building for forest countries, focused on peatlands, restoration and measurement, reporting and verification. Welcome. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Diveka Rogan. <laughs> Deveka is the Deputy Director of Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative, or NICFI, at the Ministry of Climate and Environment. And, and NICFI, as you have heard, is the flagship international climate and nature initiative working to halt and reverse tropical forest deforestation. Uh, next, I would like to uh, welcome Niels Vilod to the stage. Niels is from Satelligence, uh, founder and co-director. He's determined to make a meaningful impact measuring progress with satellite-based analytics with a focus on more sustainable uh, agri-commodities and has been working in commodity production uh, in these landscapes for over 20 years. Welcome. And last, but by no means least, um, please welcome Will Marshall. <clears throat> Yeah. 
use of your partnership. Uh, Will is the chairman, co-founder, and CEO of commercial satellite operator Planet, uh, a scientist turned entrepreneur uh, who has helped build Planet from a small team in a garage uh, to the company of nearly a thousand employees that it is today. The mission of Planet is to accelerate humanity towards a more sustainable and secure world, something that through the high cadence and always-on capability of the satellites that they offer, continues to drive towards and support across different environmental applications. So welcome to you all. So I'm going to start this panel with a question to each of you in turn, and then I hope to open that up to a much wider discussion. Uh, I will start with you, Rolf, if I may. Um, perhaps you can give some examples of where you see public and private sectors working together in the Earth observation industry. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I'd like to do that. And as you already did say in your introduction, uh, we're in the fortunate position of connecting space and Earth, making sure that all the data that's flown up there are taken down so it can be actually uh, put into actionable uh, information that can be used here on Earth. So we're, we're communicating with satellites more than 1.3 1, 1 1 million times every year. That shows two things. It shows a lot of satellites, a lot of information is gathering, and uh, it's gathered, and it's uh, also quite an um, uh, efficient way of getting it down into Earth. But till your question, um, I think the public and uh, private uh, cooperation uh, is, is a very interesting and good one, and that's not a controversial thing to say in this audience. Uh, but they both strengthen and enhance one another. Because at one point, and no offense to anyone, uh, the, the private side tends sometimes to be a little bit more innovative than uh, the public sector. So that means that the private sector can come up with ideas that the public can endorse and support in the initial phase. Having said so, the public sector uh, can also put constraints and challenge the private sector to become uh, in innovative and, and be creative in their way of thinking. So that relationship strengthens uh, both parties and it shall def can definitely be used in the future. As a final short example, uh, I had a chat with our friends from, the, uh, from UMETSAT yesterday and um, they are doing satellite collection in the meteorology world through traditional systems where they have big legacy satellites coming down into the earth. They have a standard set of collecting data. We're having a really good dialogue these days on how we could use innovative new approaches to satellite data collection and, and how that can be ingested into their systems. So by talking together in the pre-phase, it's up to them to decide how they do it uh, in the longer run. And as the previous speakers say, come up with solutions where you have both um, legacy systems and new systems working together. So long answer to yes, I see a lot of potential in that relationship. <laughs> No, th thank you, thank you, Rolf, and, and I think that leads on to, to the question I just want to ask uh, Will, and that's why are these commercial missions so important for public climate benefits? Well, I think it's a little bit to do with what R Ralph was just, Ralph was just saying about the fact that there's this innovation that produces new data sets. I mean, really what we're finding in, in, in the beginning, there's a space renaissance going on, everyone knows about the cheaper rockets. Um, but actually, the big upshot um, is less about the rockets and the satellites, which we space geeks really love, <laughs> um, but more about the data and the applications to the Earth, right? I mean, it's all connected with the Earth economy, um, whether that's Starlink or OneWeb producing more communications, data bandwidth, um, we, or Earth observation fleets like our own, or a couple of hundred satellites that produce more data, we're producing gobs more data or moving gobs more data around the planet the upshot of which is helping us to take care of the planet. You can't manage what you don't measure, right? I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, um, one is that we, we've been working with NASA on um, getting our data to underpin key climate variables. And it turns out the extra resolution compared with Landsat or Sentinel and the temporal resolution, when it's calibrated to those fantastic scientific missions, is more useful for a whole bunch of uh, measurement of climate biodiversity, um, uh, uh, glacial uh, modeling and everything. And so we're seeing thousands and thousands of papers come up because of this innovative program we have with NASA. Another one is our partnership with Rolf and, and, and Norway and, and the UNFAO here, our partners here on stage, uh, which the Environment Minister uh, mentioned yesterday, which is tracking deforestation in 64 countries. It's a public-private partnership where it's making some of that data available as a digital public good 
to track and stop deforestation in the 64 tropical belt countries, the lungs of our planet, and we're seeing a, a tenfold increase in the number of actions, that is, where interventions where the government, uh, like po local police, can stop illegal deforestation or courts of law can bring deforestation cases um, um, to court. And, and that is what is enabling I mean, uh, uh, us to take care of our forests. So you can't manage what you don't measure, and private data sets uh, are, are part of that puzzle. Thank you, Will. No, and, and I think, uh, and I'm sure we'll touch upon it in these discussions more, and that the uniqueness of the satellite data program um, that, that, that Norway has funded and, and what that's now enabling, and I think there'll be some examples, I think, of how this data is being, being used as well. Um, and, Deveka, maybe this is a good time to, 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 to move to you and move to perhaps some of these examples. And, you know, we've... Uh, we heard from the minister yesterday and through some of the other discussions about how, and, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say it's considered NICFI are showing some leadership in terms of uh, the initiative taken here with the NICFI satellite data program. Um, and and I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on why, why these types of partnership is so important for, for those policy goals that you have from, from Norway and beyond. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And... and um, some in the audience might not be that familiar with, with Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative, NICFI. So I'll just say a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, NICFI was uh, launched by the Norwegian government uh, 15 years ago. And it's, the, it's Norway's largest international effort to help combat climate change and preserve biodiversity. Our objective is to support tropical forest countries with protecting what's left of the world's rainforests. Um, Without these forests, there, there is no way that we'll be able to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. There is no way that we'll be able to reach our, our, um, our global biodiversity goals. Um, so improved monitoring of, of the tropical forest is really crucial if we are to reduce deforestation. We need to know what's, hap what, what's happening in the forest, uh, where the forest is disappearing, when it is disappearing, and why it is disappearing. As, as Will said, uh, you, what you, you can't measure what you can't manage, so we need this, this type of data. Um, now, uh, forest, this type of forest monitoring is, is quite difficult, and satellite data, although it was available prior to the NICFI uh, satellite data program, it was expensive, and it was only available to, to a few selected actors. So this is why uh, NICFI decided to grant this free access to high-resolution satellite imagery of the tropics to anyone, anywhere. We felt this was really the, the missing piece in the global effort to, to protect the rainforests. Um, and we got this great team together to help us with this. Uh, Kongsberg Satellite Services, Planet and Airbus, together they ensure this regular distribution of, of satellite data. Um, and also help uh, users with, with all kinds of technical issues. And I here also want to recognize FAO with the analytical platform CEPAL. I think without CEPAL, many out there would have uh, access to the data, but not really have the resources to use it and to, to run the analytics. So since the launch of this program, uh, which is now two and a half years in, um, we've seen uh, more than 18,000 registered users from 158 countries around the world. And we know that many, many more are accessing and using the data through the, the Global Forest Watch platform and, and the Google Earth uh, engine. And I think it's a really powerful example of how public actors and private actors can join hands to find solutions, to give access to the data, to help users um, analyzing the data um, as a way of contributing to address the climate and, and nature crisis. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a bit more about, about some of those um, outcomes as well and, and some of the things that we're seeing. But if, I, if I maybe move to, to you, Niels, um, coming from the kind of private sector side and how, how you're using this data, and, and, and maybe you can kind of comment a little bit from your experience on how um, you know, now we're seeing that the private sector need to meet these obligations for climate-related policies more, the new EU directive, for example. Um, how are you seeing that commercial services support and perhaps some of these other initiatives are able to help you meet those goals? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that the private sector speed, uh, the passion and pragmatism has already been leveraged uh, to make a difference. 
17 years ago, I was at the uh, climate conference in uh, Nairobi, and then I met a peatland uh, specialist, scientist, renowned scientist. Peatlands store a lot of carbon in the ground. Uh, if they're deforested uh, or burned, and they emit a huge amount of carbon. Um, so they gave me their spatial data of peatland distribution. And at that time, I was working on uh, spot vegetation, uh, a time series of deforestation. That's one kilometer resolution. Every 10 days, you had uh, a cloudy image. Uh, yes, Will, uh, that's one kilometer. You can <laughs> imagine that now. Uh, that was before your uh, breakthrough, uh, before free Landsat. Uh, before the Sentinels. Um, anyway, I was uh, at the poolside uh, with my laptop, having a nice cool uh, Tusker beer, <laughs> just overlaying this data of peatland distribution uh, and, and of the deforestation and the plantations. And then we uncovered that actually the deforestation of peatland was time, five times as much as um, a normal uh, forest, and that it was accelerating. So we wrote a quick note to the Dutch delegation uh, they took it uh, to uh, the agenda, and ever since it has been on the agenda of the climate conference to take action uh, for peatland deforestation. And, and the second last example is that uh, to help corporations prove uh, no deforestation when they are sourcing on investing uh, in ingredients or parts, for example, BMW, the leather in their cars, uh, the timber in the furniture of IKEA, or the soy, uh, cocoa, uh, and palm oil uh, for corporations just like Cargill, Unilever, uh, Mondelez, PepsiCo, all the food we eat, right? Um, so we found that satellite data can be used to measure progress. We found that palm oil-driven deforestation is now at a 20-year low because all these companies have commitments. Mm. And that's really great news. Even uh, the, the most aggressive campaigning NGOs uh, applaud this progress. Mm -hmm. However, my final remark, uh, I also want to say uh, that um, there are still many more companies that we need to address. There are so many more users, uh, and they don't have monitoring. They don't take action. Uh, and that is also because I think most of us are still living in parallel universes. <laughs> We're all living in, in silos, and uh, silos hamper progress. Um, I think that uh, if we work together, uh, yeah, that, that spending, for example, uh, millions in data and software, it's good, but it's not enough. In our work, uh, it evolves a lot around the handholding of new users, educating the market. Many of them drown in data. So we have to help them. And unfortunately, not always, the donor silo has been supportive of this kind of help. Uh, for example, the, the Joint Research Center in the EU, uh, they are setting up a similar system with taxpayers' money. Say, why? <laughs> uh, then uh, also we hear some governments say, yeah, we cannot fund uh, the private sector, that's for profit. So then they fund NGOs to do similar things. Why is that? Uh, I think that um, yeah, philanthropy will not save the world fast enough. Mm. So it's also like the, the durable business models can help uh, to educate the market. Powerful, durable. Let us cooperate. Uh, let us work together. Uh, yeah, and to break down these silos. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, and I think we've seen that in the discussions from the first day here yesterday as well, about the, the power of working together and, and how beneficial that can be, and hopefully we'll touch on some of that during the discussion. Uh, and before we move to, to the discussion, um, Julian, I'd, I'd really like to, you know, from your perspective, from UN, FAO, and the experience that you have, um, you know, the, the adoption of this type of technology to support the monitoring um, and reporting is clearly crit critical to, to the work that you do uh, from the UN side. Um, could you speak perhaps to how you are supporting countries um, in using this type of data and with their reporting obligations? Sure. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, and just, um, yeah, great intervention so far. So. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think for me and for, for uh, the forest monitoring community, the, the NICFI satellite data program was a real game changer. Actually, um, in 2018, as FAO, we, we were supporting many forest countries, and we, we identified 
a need for this sort of data. Um, you know, we have access to very high resolution imagery through platforms like Google Earth, but it's, it doesn't have a timestamp, right? And when countries are, are measuring, reporting and verifying their data, they need, they need to know exactly when the image is, is taken in a consistent way for, for reference level construction and then for reporting against that construction. So in 2018, we actually launched our own procurement to, to find sort of data that was high spatial, high temporal resolution. And uh, we, we, we did that initially with eight countries, and it was a big success. And we were absolutely delighted then when NICFI took, took <laughs> a responsibility, because it's a very difficult process to, to do a public procurement. And, the, and then NICFI satellite data program emerged. And it, it's been a real game changer. Um, I'll, I'll quickly provide two examples from the countries, and it would have been great to have the forest countries here, but I'll speak on their behalf, if they don't mind. So the first one is Ghana. We've been supporting them for several years um, to improve their, we call it activity data in the, in the context of Red Plus. It's, uh, it's basically change in, in forest area and, and reporting that using a reference level then reporting against it for, to receive Red Plus results. But we, we worked with them using our platforms and thank you, thank you um, Daika for the kind comments on CEPAL. We used our open source platforms and the, the NICFI satellite data to help them show their results to the, to the World Bank, firstly, and they, they were able to access uh, $5 million uh, from the World, World Bank's carbon fund for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, but also enhancing removals from afforestation and reforestation in, in their cocoa forest landscape. So they, the government of Ghana had acted. They used this new data. They used uh, plat our platforms and tools, which we're very proud of to report this progress and receive funding for this. And for the forest countries, this is extremely important because it allows them to raise their ambition to, to reduce deforestation further, to enhance their forest carbon stocks much more. And another great outcome for Ghana is that their, their new data is also compliant with, with the R3 standard, which the LEAF Coalition has selected as their accounting standard. And now we see things like the LEAF Coalition, which is a big public-private um, incredible movement. I think they've raised over a billion dollars, and this, this is such an exciting opportunity for the forest countries. So using this data, using, using the tools and technologies that are available, we're really busy at the moment supporting other countries on a similar pathway. So to improve their data, to access results-based finance, and participate in some of the emerging um, opportunities such as LEAF. The second example, sorry, I, um, it's, uh, is from Central Africa, and it's, it's through the Central African Forest Initiative. We've been working uh, intensively with DRC, Congo, Gabon, Cameroon, Central Africa Republic, and Equatorial Guinea, really to improve their understanding of what is driving deforestation and forest degradation. And we used the NICFI satellite data program, we used the Copernicus, the, the Landsat time series, and we really helped the country technicians create data for those, for those drivers. And this is significant because yesterday we talked a lot about turning data into action. Mm. And now uh, through CAFI, um, the countries are looking at how they can basically change their land use to tackle these drivers of deforestation and degradation. So th I think that's a fantastic example of using the NICFI satellite data program um, to create great data and then turning that into climate impact. So that's, that's an ongoing activity in CAFI, and I understand that investments are now being framed around this data to basically uh, tackle the, the drivers of deforestation and degradation head on. So two examples, and maybe one challenge to everybody here. <laughs> from, from FAO, we, we think a lot about the sustainability of our support to countries, and that's why we've leveraged hugely uh, the Copernicus and the, and the Landsat time series. And uh, the NICFI satellite data program has been a game changer. And I know that it does have a shelf life, but I'd love to think about how we can move this resource into the public domain because the countries are using it, as, as we've heard. And uh, that's, that's a, a challenging question for everybody. Maybe, maybe we can tackle that. Yeah. Thanks.
Thank you, Julian. And, and, and I think, as you say, it's, uh, now we're starting to see countries who are using this data in their UN FCCC reporting and actually showing such a, a, a high value in terms of the, the return that they're getting from using <coughs> this data. They're getting more accurate estima estimations. And of course, as you were mentioning yesterday in one of the panels as well, the, um, the, the kind of value, uh, value return that they get as a country in terms of the, the, these um, benefits that they get for, for reporting that and accurately measuring. I think you, you touched on a really important point right at the end there about the sustainability of, of, the, of initiatives like this. And, Deveka, maybe this is a good time to ask uh, NICFI in terms of, you know, as this is a NICFI funded program, it does have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could uh, talk to the perspectives of NICFI about, about this initiative and what, um, what might happen um, or, or what the view is post 2024. Sure, and I think, um, I think the minister also touched a little bit on this yesterday in his, uh, in his opening remarks, but NICFI has of course provided this data to, to the world uh, for free for the past two and a half years, and we believe it's been a, a very successful sort of pilot program um, that it's shown the importance of this data um, in terms of, of stopping deforestation. And we are, I think, strengthened in our belief that this should continue to be a global public good in light of the ongoing climate and, and nature crisis. And I think we are also encouraged that this perspective seems to be shared by many other actors, including those of you who are um, responsible for Earth observation and, and development of, of satellite um, imagery. Now, the current contract, as we know, runs out in September 2024, so uh, a bit more than a year from now. And from what I know, there will be a gap between the end of our program and, and when the Copernicus High Resolution uh, satellites come online in 2032. Um, there is other data available, but not with the same quality, granularity, frequency as what we are currently providing. So um, NICFI cannot alone continue to provide this data to the world uh, at the current cost, uh, but we are open to exploring partnerships with other funders so that we can continue with this public good. Thank you, uh, and, and I think that's, that's really good to hear, hopefully, for, for others in the room, and, and maybe it will pro pro provoke some more questions. Um, please do use the Slido app to, to ask questions as well so that we can uh, challenge the panel with uh, some of those things that, that you would like to know. But I think the future of the program is critical. All the discussions I've had here and in uh, events recently is, is clearly shows the benefits, so, so now it's, it's how we actually uh, make, that, make that happen. Um, and perhaps kind of thinking along the same lines when it comes to programs and initiatives like this, if I take it back to the commercial um, satellite side and, um, and perhaps direct to you, Rolf, first and then, and then on to, to Will, um, it's how, how can the commercial sector um, from, from EO perspective do, do more um, in, with these types of initiatives and, and how, where do we go from here? Yep. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. What do we do with data continuity? How do we uh, uh, get away from the shelving of an excellent program? And I think this is, uh, again, a good example on the partnership here, because there's a duality here. I mean, obviously, the, the NIC3 program um, has to show some initiatives on, on their ambitions to expand. Then we can help enhancing it, because if you just go on uh, doing what you have done, uh, you will kind of uh, lose interest and, uh, and at, uh, at the time die. So we have to be innovative. We have to come up with new ideas. We have to come up with how can we enhance it? Can we add uh, different parameters in, uh, into the program? Uh, we had a conversation this morning that touched upon exactly that. So that's one parameter, one dimension. The other dimension we can throw in is how can NICFI as a framework be expanded to other areas? Uh, can we uh, leverage of the, the creativity in the program to start looking for, for uh, in, in monitoring of the Arctic, for example? Mm. So, again, in the period before the current program ends, we should get together and uh, challenge one another on what's NICFI 2.0, because 1.0 has been a success, and we just have to move on. Mm. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I, I build exactly on Wolf's remarks. I mean, look, um, to nail your point, I mean, we're in a climate and nature emergency here and we can't be in our silos. I mean, this mm. is just crazy. And this is why these public-private partnerships are exactly what we need, I think, to break out. Um, the private sector has some data to offer, the public sector has some ways of 
driving new mechanisms uh, and markets. And I mean, I, I think the ex to, to Rob's point, I think in terms of extrapolation, what I'm most excited about is how we can now move into not just forest extent, but forest carbon. Um, uh, at Planet, uh, we have these 200 satellites, but we, we're also trying to build a certain standardized analytics. Um, we call them planetary variables, land surface temperature, soil moisture, above ground carbon, uh, above ground uh, biomass. The one that I'm most excited about is above ground carbon. Um, we have a small team that's building, but literally uh, almost down to the tree level, carbon measurements of forests. And if you can get an accurate measurement of carbon, then you can underpin carbon markets. Um, I mean, a long-term extrapolation of how we can um, uh, talk about the, uh, the future of NICV in a way is how that becomes something that a market pays for in a transaction between uh, countries and companies that want to buy carbon and the sellers of those and supply, if you like, of that carbon uh, in the form of the countries that, in any case, we are trying to help protect those lands. Actually, the, the advantage of that is that it can even get down to the indigenous communities that safeguard you know, a significant fraction of our uh, forests and, and, and nature. Um, and to the extrapolation point to other areas, this model can be used in other areas. I mean, I could look at FAO and talk about some of the priorities they have, as an example. Agriculture, well, satellite data can be... Agriculture and the transition to sustainable agriculture is a cornerstone of our ability to meet our climate and nature and biodiversity goals. And we can imagine a similar monitoring system for monitoring sustainable forests, uh, sorry, sustainable agriculture practices like tilling and cover crop use and things like that. That can be done from space and in a uniform way, just like we're doing with the forest. Um, in fisheries, we can monitor illegal fishing off coastlines. That's another uh, prerogative of FAO. Um, one can imagine extrapolating this to, uh, sort of program to other areas. It's a novel model. Uh, of public-private partnership that I think um, can help us to tackle. And, you know, uh, 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 to Julian's point, it's not just enhancing countries' ability to do it, it's accelerating. I mean, we have, again, we've got to t make a right-hand turn on tackling uh, nature and climate. And these are the tools that, we, that can empower that transition to happen in one year or two years rather than one decade or two decades. Mm. And that is what we all need. They're, they're globally you know, um, scalable. So as soon as you get it working in a small area, you can extrapolate to the whole world. And that's exactly what the world needs um, at this crucial time. Mm. It's perhaps easier said than done, though. Sure. Well, <laughs> it, takes a, it takes consortiums of actors coming together, breaking down those silos, and, and I think what you're hearing here at this conference is a lot of, not just in this, on this panel here, cooperation and intent and similar goals and, and mindset to do that, right? Space is, uh, you know, traditionally, and I think this is why this IAF Congress is, 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 is so good and why I'm here, is that you know, space has been so focused on itself and scientific missions and exploration, but Earth observation is the critical way in which we can help uh, uh, people on the ground. And this focus point, it, there's no more urgent thing for the space sector to be applying its muscle to than this climate challenge, and, and, and I think everyone has a similar mindset here, so I think we're in a, we're, we're in a collaborative spirit. Yeah, definitely, and, and, and perhaps moving to the, the, the kind of private sector in, in this regard, because this has always been a little bit more challenging in terms of data access, and, um, and there's some questions here which I'll, I'll come to shortly, but, but speaking to the um, you know, the, the, the not-for-profit um, access, you know, that this data is being provided as a public good. It is a non-commercial resource, but it is being used by private sector to help with their zero deforestation reporting because that's not a profit-gaining uh, element. That's where it has, of course, benefit. And, of course, as we move towards this EU directive, that perspective might change because, of course, there are then additional regulations that haven't been in place anymore. Um, and perhaps, um, Niels, you could maybe comment on um, as, as we move forward to, towards that, what, what's the impact that you see on these types of initiatives and how they also need to be shaped to be either more broad or more accessible to, to the private sector as well as to the other entities, all of whom who are contributing towards climate goals? Right. Um, I, I also might, uh, have included maybe a critical note, but uh, I also want to say that the NICFI program is fantastic because... Uh, 
I, I brought in the example of the one kilometer data, mm. and, and now we have much, much higher resolution. And it's important mm. because a lot of the commodities produced are produced by small farmers. <laughs> they get lost in a one kilometer pixel, right? Mm. So you need to have the detail uh, to monitor them and make sure that they are included, that they gain access uh, to the international markets. So, so that is where the NIC fee work is fantastic. Uh, and I was also a bit triggered that I think that there is so much more potential that can be unlocked. Uh, I think from this discussion that actually the private sector can be the gateway to the private sector, which is like the, all the corporations that I mentioned. It is even the farmers' organizations. We can be that extra link. Uh, we are working on public data, satellite data, because otherwise it gets also uh, not feasible for many big corporations, like a Mondelez. They source from 1,500 companies around the whole world, uh, palm oil, for example, uh, with 100,000 of farmers and farms, etc. You need to monitor everything. So, and that's also why it is super cool that uh, the entire tropics are, are covered. That's very important. So, gateway to the private sector by the private sector, I think that's a nice thing. And, and that leads on nicely. We've had some questions uh, from the audience. Um, one of the questions we've had is, uh, and I think this is a general question to, to perhaps this group here, do you think that European culture has an aversion to companies making profit and that is hampering the speed of response to climate change? That's a really good question. Um, is, that, is that leading to some barriers? Definitely. Next question. Mm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, you're right. I mean like, come on, we, we definitely see that. I mean... Uh, uh, we're an American and European company, and we find a very different level of reception in the US uh, uh, from governments to leveraging technology. There's very much a buy what we can, build what we must mm. attitude. And I just don't think that has happened yet in Europe, and I think that that's, that's a, that would be a very positive transition that enable us to go faster. Um, the, what Europe has right is much stronger and better environmental policies. Mm. I mean, the policies are all there. If you look at the European Green Deal, to take the biggest you know, actor here, um, all of those priorities, uh, you know, protecting the forests, um, helping the fisheries, uh, enabling um, us to protect biodiverse regions, and so on, and transitioning the common agricultural policy to a sustainable one, can be advanced with space technology, but most of it is in private hands. And so, we need to work together, and that needs to be a collaborative spirit. But I, I do see there's a lot of interest and intent on that. Uh, but yeah, there's, there are barriers. And it just, I, I think that um, if Europe flipped, it wouldn't just be that it would benefit and accelerate those policies. It would be also that it would build up capacity mm. to then help other continents do that faster as well. So I, I, th I see it as doubly short-sighted to have that attitude. And of course, it's not universal. It, you, we're talking, that's a very... We're making generic statements yeah. here, but you made you made a very clear uh, answer to that one, and one can continue on and say there there are no free lunch, yeah. but that doesn't mean that everybody's out there to uh, to squeeze the most out of everything because yeah. we have a common responsibility to make that happen to make the efficient utilization of the data. And again, since Nick is the common team here, they did an excellent job totally. in negotiating a deal that wasn't commercial viable uh, before yeah. Nick there was no way that the, the satellite providers would give away, quote unquote, the data in the way they did. Uh, but in the, uh, in the, with a focus on the common objective and, and the goals, uh, the common goal to make this happen, uh, they, they pushed the industry into something that was much, more, much less commercial than before. And, and I think that that's actually a good point because mm. the industry also needs to change its attitude about this. This is a public good exercise. Mm. We, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of for Planet is that we went public as a public benefit corporation, mm. which means that the fiduciary duty of the directors of our company are not just the shareholder value, they're to our mission, mm. which is about using space to help life on Earth, essentially. And I think that that's a positive development that other uh, p uh, private companies should consider those sort of new forms that aren't just about shareholder value. This is about a public good mission, a societal value of a challenge we've got to tackle on the planet. And so I would encourage other industry leaders to think about how they flip to that kind of model as well. So both sides have got some work to do. Mm.
Definitely, definitely. And, and I think that's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it, it provokes this kind of discussion and that we can, we can learn from um, initiatives like NICFI, which is funded something that's completely unique. As you say, Will, this is not something that had ever been done before. And now it's, it's making such a large volume of data available for what will be four years mm -hmm. uh, for the contract term. Um, and Deveka, if I can come back to you. And uh, we, we've heard a little bit from Julian about some of the examples from uh, UNFAO in terms of how uh, this data has been used and perhaps if we kind of follow down that stream on some of the examples and impact that you have seen from from NICFI side just as a another way to kind of enhance this discussion on the value of these types of initiatives. Mm. No sure and I think we've, we've heard similar feedback as, as, as Julian was talking about in terms of uh, access to satellite data really being a game changer for for understanding and responding to deforestation in the tropics. Um, Forest country governments are the biggest user group of, of the data. So Brazil, Colombia, Gabon and, and many others. Um, they use it to, uh, to detect and, and validate and quickly respond to changes in the, in the, in the forest cover. Um, some have built uh, sort of early warning systems using the data so they can detect forest fires. And they also use it to, to strengthen their capacity to to uh, investigate and prosecute um, activities related to illegal uh, deforestation. And I think for this type of use, the, the high resolution and, and the frequency of the data has been uh, particularly important. Um, another big user group is civil society at large, NGOs, media, academia, indigenous groups. Many civil society groups use the data to hold their governments to account for progress on, on environmental policy. Um, we've seen some examples of indigenous groups actually using it to monitor their territories. So they download the data on their smartphones and then they use that, that data to, to plan patrols where they gather evidence of illegal activities occurring in their territories. And they're handing this data then over to, or this evidence over to governments for, to, or local authorities for, for, for further action. So that's interesting to see the, the sort of very var variety of uses. And then I think the last example is, is, is sort of private sector, where um, more than two thirds of tropical deforestation occurs due to the projection of just four commodities. So you talked about palm oil, there's beef, soy, um, pulp and, and timber. So obviously there is no way that we can reduce tropical forest um, uh, loss without the co uh, collaboration of private sector. I think we're seeing a few examples of global companies using the data to, to uh, sort of validate deforestation alerts in, in commodity uh, producing regions and to, to engage with their suppliers to address deforestation risk in the supply chain. But I do think it's, there is a lot bigger potential for private sector to make use of the data in, yeah. in light of the, of the EU regulation in particular. And I think this is maybe, and I wanted to ask you, because I think this is where we've seen the least use, I think, in terms of the, of the user groups. Yeah. Perhaps, Nils, if you want to speak to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that is because uh, of the distance. I remember uh, going to the biggest agriculture bank, uh, or one of the biggest rubber bank in the Netherlands, and I was talking to a banker, he said, what are you telling me? This looks like you're from space. Well, in a way, <laughs> and we were talking completely different languages. So the gap is, is so big. Mm. And uh, I honestly think that if you look at these corporations, Unilever, uh, they're pretty advanced, but there's many more. Um, they simply don't have the capacity to understand what's going on in a completely different uh, sector. Uh, maybe uh, big corporations even have one sustainability person mm. who has to take care of social things, <laughs> environmental things, a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. Then they have to learn about images and <laughs> data, how mm. can they use that? So that the gap is huge. And yeah, that's why I was also triggered by this conversation that I think that if you think about it as a private sector, uh, a purpose-driven uh, enterprise, we're more, fo more focused on actually the, the, the education, the handholding, as I said, and preventing you know, people from drowning. And there's, there's a lot of more potential there to, to uh, have much better uptake uh, of mm. imagery. So we're, we're happy to, uh, to fill that gap. Uh, 
in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Charlotte, may I add on to that? Because you're, you're hitting a nerve here. Uh, we are all, you said Space Geek, we are all so focused on what we're doing and we lose a lot of the audience by staying tuned on what we think is the coolest thing on Earth. Uh, <laughs> or off Earth. <laughs> <laughs> and above Earth. So I definitely agree with you. So that's why we have uh, in, in this partnership, the, there shouldn't, uh, the, the value of communication shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, and, and you took the palm oil example. KSAT is um, also uh, looking for oil spill and we find ships and stuff. Uh, and um, some years ago, outside of, of Denmark, there was a lot of uh, tankers that cleaned their tanks when they, before they went into Rotterdam to refill. And the mere fact that we announced that, hey, you are spotted, you are, you are seen, we know what you're doing, had an impact. The same thing goes to League Fishery where we've done a couple of pilots where the fact that you broadcast that you are watched uh, made a huge impact on, on the illegal fishery. So back into your palm oil example, it shows that being watched has an effect. Mm. And, yeah. and, and we should probably, as a community now in the global impact, focus on just let the world know that things are happening. Somebody up there, our, yeah. our, our big brother is watching, and, and you should announce that rather than being too specific in that niche or that, that needs and then other areas. Yeah, we actually had a really interesting example of that. Um, the Allen Coral Atlas was built um, leveraging satellite data to monitor coral reefs and f produce a map of them. And there's been 30 marine protected areas being built as a result of this map. Mm. And I was like, oh, scratching my head, why? Sri Lanka already knew it had a coral reef, right? It's not like that was, must, can't have been news to them. Uh, but they didn't have a precise map of where it was. A, so uh, it, this provides them actual information. Here's where the illegal f fishing is uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, or here's the early signs of ocean bleaching. But it also was the fact that it was being published, so <laughs> Sri Lanka knew <laughs> that everyone knew about its coral reef, so it, it upped the ante. So the mere fact of having the data out there mm. changed policy. And I think that, um, so that's one of the powers, but you know, I do think that, uh, you know, to earlier point, the, uh, the Earth observation community and the space community needs to get it out of its space head, and we've really focused on those solutions, the end game. And I think, you know, the Nick Fee partnership again is an, a pioneering example of how to really bridge those gaps. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, transparency, and, and perhaps, uh, yeah. uh, did you want to comment on that as well? Did yeah, you? yeah, I actually wanted to pick up on uh, Neil's and Deveka's comments on, on the upcoming EU regu regulation mm. on. on oh, great. Uh, on the deforestation-free commodities. Actually, yeah. the, the NICFI satellite data program and the data is, is, really, is really good for that. And I, I think the countries at the moment, the, the producer countries that uh, will have to respond to this regulation, they have to feed their population and export commodities that are shown to be deforestation-free, um, this sort of data is really critical to that, actually, to benchmark the, um, the, their production cycles. So it's something that the forest countries are starting to think a lot about, and that's why I think uh, the continuity of this program and is, uh, can serve that purpose as well, which we see a lot. I mean, the EU has a regulation, the, the UK and the US are, are not far behind. And the, I mean, I mean, we know that, uh, that a lot of deforestation is driven by agricultural activities, right? So this is a great initiative, but the, yeah, the forest countries need to have capacity and data to, to basically respond to it and to comply and, and continue, um, yeah, continue uh, reducing deforestation, and, uh, but also feeding their population. So I just wanted to add that as another critical need for, for the NICFI satellite data program. And, and if we're talking about data, um, from your perspective and from the perspective of the, the countries, the capacity building that you do, what other data sources would you like to see? If you, if, you know, let's, let's pose this question, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. we have commercial satellite data providers on the stage, we have um, others here. What, what would you like to see from, from your side? And then maybe Nils can also comment on what, what he would like to see. <laughs> I think everybody wants like super, Everything. <laughs> super high resolution imaging, right? <laughs> but it's not, it's difficult to work with. It's, um, but that is what the country technicians like the most, right? Really high resolution imagery. Um, but, what, but what is coming through the NICFI satellite data program sort of hits that sweet spot, right? It has, it has good enough spatial resolution to do reference data collection to validate your geospatial work. And, um, and also there's the level two data with, with the high temporal frequency, which is brilliant for things like early warning systems, fire, fire response. So, I mean, I actually feel like that uh, it hits a sweet spot. Of course, all the technicians want 
to see centimeter perfect imagery, but get working on it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. But there are two dimensions to this as well. One is the, the amount of data, the, the type of information that you can use to come up with uh, with the final product that you're going to actually upon. And in some areas, it's also timeliness, because if you're going to watch a, a wildfire running a while, then you should have information available there. Uh, at the time, so you can guide the firefighters to go and do what they want to do. So again, it's a super complex thing here. I mean, uh, and, and the framework that we created with NICFI is a beginning that can be expanded in a lot of dimensions. And I think that should be a focus for Yeah, the, the temporal discussions. dimension is just as important. Yeah. Actually, I think the, the space community over-focuses on the uh, spatial resolution mm -hmm. piece. And, and, and as you say, technicians, that's what they're used to. And that's, but temporal resolution and, and spectral resolution are just as important axes. I, um, I also think that we're, we're seeing, and perhaps this is you know, where this is going in the future, is most exciting, is less about the satellite data again, it's more about the analytical services that sit on top of that. I think there's a massive potential for more. I mentioned the carbon mm -hmm. sort of variable that I think that uh, w we will help to do, which the community, I think, needs. There's millions of others um, that can be extracted out of Earth observation data. And artificial intelligence and computer vision, machine learning, computer vision in particular, is, is showing itself to be tremendously capable of doing these things in ways that are easier. So it becomes easier and easier for people without satellite imaging expertise to extract value out of this data. And I think that is a... what. If there's anything that's happening in the next few years, it's going to be less about all the extra data, although there will be extra data. It will be more about where the analytical services can go that enable us to, to democratize access to that. So it's not just NASA or some, some large entity that can get benefit from our and other people's data sets, but rather that person on the ground that's trying to you know, def protect their, uh, their, their biodiverse ecosystems and they don't know how to look at satellite data, and they don't know, look, especially not to, to hyperspectral imagery or all the other analytical components. <laughs> but soon you'll just be able to ask it a question, like you can ask ChatGPT, yeah. uh, you know, how's my biodiversity doing? Oh, well, you're, <laughs> you've got fewer of these trees and more of those trees, and this is what's going on over here, and that's correlated with these kind of um, um, animals on the ground, and that's going to help us to do biodiversity protection in a new way. Um, as well, so um, really exciting uh, to look forward to that. And, and Niels, maybe you can comment, um, yeah. because I think this touches on a big point about the data, yeah. but also analytics, and you mentioned about the, the knowledge, this kind of gap between uh, you know, the actual uh, need to yeah. understand the data. Yeah, no, exactly. I think in terms of data, uh, and I'm talking for about uh, deforestation, uh, fires, uh, thermal uh, imagery would be nice to have continued Continuity, I think continuity is the big thing. Mm. Uh, so the three to five, uh, the 10 meter data, is great for deforestation, uh, fires, etc. Uh, but we need continuity. And it, it might be uh, a, a bit of uh, hampering uh, uptake of, for example, the, the, the plant NICFI data, because we don't know if it's there in the future. We know that our Sentinel data mm. is in the future, right? Mm. So it must also make bi a business sense for us to roll out all the analytics globally so that's also something we might want yeah. to talk about. It's going to continue, later. one way or another. It's going to continue. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and, and maybe we, we have uh, just under five minutes left. Um, so maybe there's a, a question I'd like to pose to all of you um, for, for your uh, perspectives on is, is you know, we've talked a lot about that we need to collaborate, we need to do more together, we need to break down these silos. How do we do that? Do you ha are there ideas or things that you could bring to, to this discussion now that, that could, could start that? What would be the way we could approach it? Yeah, we start to talk to one another. Yeah. What yeah. do we do? Well, this, this, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I, I think that it, um, companies can do more to prom to communicate what the new capabilities are. I think they can do more to um, uh, think about applications and that downstream piece. This is an ecosystem approach. I think. Governments could lean in to adopting of, of these technologies and to really um, have more flexible procurement mechanisms that enable that when this is a fast-changing, uh, you know, fast 
pace of change here in the technological environment, so you can't just say, let's plan this out for 20 years. Mm. It's just there's totally revolutionary technology in two months. Mm. You know, so you, you're going to have to, it's going to be a it's very dynamic. different yeah. dynamic uh, um, uh, procurement environment, which is totally new, right? But between those things, um, and then all the NGOs and the researchers doing pioneering where, where we need, uh, what capabilities can be built from this, I think we're, we're going in an exciting direction. So. Do you have any comments on, on that? What, um, in terms of how do we collaborate more? And obviously, UN, UNFAO, as you said, you, you put out this public procurement some years before uh, uh, NICFI did. And it's, it's, it's tough to, to do that. And how do we collaborate more to make those uh, more successful and more accessible to, to everyone? Oh, it's an amazing model. And I'm very interested to think about uh, replicating it. Um, but then you need, uh, yeah, you need some uh, strong donors or some strong corporations to get involved. Maybe, maybe the next step is to bring in the, the private sector, not just the public finance on, on a renewal like this. But yeah, just uh, from our side, I mean, we, 11 years ago, we decided to switch to fully open source uh, technical solutions, which works for us very well. And in fact, you know, the sort of work that Niels is doing often Often, uh, you know, the private entities who are driving innovation, dri creating incredible algorithms, are contributing to that as well. So it's just an open call to everybody that's innovating, creating data. That's if you want to contribute to our open, open data resource, which is all on um, GitHub. Uh, you're very welcome to because the countries are there, and we can move your innovations to operational applications in, in forest countries. But uh, yeah, I'm very interested to. Well, I'm very hopeful that. Uh, the data program will be extended in some form. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting to think about how we can replicate it, because it's been really successful. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Debecca, Niels, with any comments? Yeah, I think definitely more collaboration. I think with the new EU regulation, it's important to, to extend that dialogue to include more forest countries and also a more diverse group of private sector. Obviously, the commodity producers, traders, but also financial institutions, regional banks, and, and so forth that have an interest in, 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 in this and, and in using the data. I think that's one. I think we also need to talk more across the sort of carbon community and the biodiversity nature community, because I think those work a little bit in, in, in silos. And I think we're seeing now that we've been very focused on measuring carbon and we've we're able to sort of, there is a one unit for that and we can put a value on that, but now we are also seeing in our conversations with partner countries that, hang on, we need to also put the value on all of that biodiversity within our forests. Yep. And how do we do that? It's much more complex. There is no one single unit of, of measurement. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be exciting to see how, how satellite data can contribute to, to take that discussion forward. Yeah. And Niels, uh, the last word is yours, comment from Yeah, from let's you. continue the conversation. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's been, it's been a great panel. It's flown by. I would love to ask more questions, um, but I want to take this opportunity to thank Will, Rolf, Julian, Diveka and Nils. And I hope everyone here has also enjoyed this uh, very active discussion, I think, on, on how uh, Earth observation data can support climate policy. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.